All right, so the goal is that we want to have a bunch of images on our level to decorate the map. So far, the way we've structured our engine is that we have a list of game objects, and then we have a map that contains walls. In my mind, I imagine the decorations of our level to belong in the map alongside the walls. So how about we create a list of decorations in the map, and we can populate that list with whatever images we want to use to pretty up the level. We'll also need to make a class called decoration, or decor, <laughs> for short, and that will be the class we use to store these images and the position they should draw it. So let's go over here to the map class. I've already got it up here. I'd like to create the new decoration class in this same file because to me it's all kind of the same thing. Down here we made the wall class. So underneath this parenthesis here, or this bracket, I'm sorry, we will make a new class, a public class, called decor. And let's say that all decorations are game objects because all of the game object functionality is basically all of the exact things we'll need for the decoration, right? We'll need a position, we'll need a draw color, we'll need a texture 2D. All that stuff is already in the game object class, so I'm just going to say it's a game object. And two brackets there. Let's create a public string called image path. This is the path or the file location of where the image is located in our computer. Okay, So usually this would point to something in the content folder because that's where we're keeping all of our images. Next I'd like to make a public rectangle called source rectangle, or source rect for short. And we won't do too much with this right now, but um, really fast, let me go to the Michael Hicks toolbox. Art. Here we have a sprite sheet, and later on in a few videos we will be animating this sprite sheet, but notice how we have a bunch of different images all on one big canvas. A lot of times when you're adding environment art, what people like to do is put like two or three different buildings all on one canvas. So we will define a rectangle inside of our decoration class that tells us what piece of the image we want to draw. Okay? We'll have a similar approach to how we animate the sprite sheet. We'll have a rectangle that draws only one chunk, right? So we'll define a rectangle for this guy here, the first guy, and then we'll move the rectangle over here when we want to draw the second frame. It's just a way of drawing one small chunk off of one bigger image, okay? We won't, like I said, we won't use the decoration source rectangle uh, in this video, but I'd like to go ahead and set it up because it's something we'll want to use later. The last variable I'd like to define is actually a property. Later on, a few videos down, we're going to be making an editor, and in that editor, one of the key things you'll be doing is loading in images to decorate your level with. And in the editor, you'll want to have a name that displays for each image. So the editor will be looking for a property to define what the name is for each image. So we'll go ahead and make that property now. So whenever you're using properties, you use the get and set keywords. And inside get, similar to a function, we'll just return the image path. Nothing crazy, but it's looking for this uh, this keyword here later on. So next, we can make a constructor. Let's make an empty constructor first, and inside the empty constructor, we'll set collidable to false because you'll never want to collide with a decoration. Next, we'll make another constructor, but this one will have a few parameters that we can pass in. The first parameter should be the input position, where we want the decoration to be positioned at. The next one will be an input image path. This is the location of our image, where we want to load it from. And then finally, we'll have input depth. We'll want to be able to customize the depth for each one of our decorations 
because sometimes we'll want one image to draw in front of another image. Uh, we want to make sure that's easily changeable. In here, we'll just set everything that was passed in. So position equals input position, image path equals input image path, and depth, or layer depth, I'm sorry, equals input depth. Let's also set active to true. All decorations sh should start out being active, and also, like in the other constructor, set collidable to false. Next, we're going to create a new type of load function. Remember, in the past, we've been overriding the load function we defined in game object and just adding new functionality. I'd like to create a brand new load function that takes in two parameters instead of one. So let's say public. Let's make it virtual. Public virtual void load will take in a content manager and also the name of the asset that we want to load. So the reason that we are using a variable here to load in the path of our image is because potentially we can load a whole range of different images to be our decoration. In the past, whenever we've loaded in an image, we've always hard-coded it to say load in sprite, that specific image. But decorations are a little more flexible. There's a whole list of things we could load in, and it would be a big pain to sit here and hard code every single path for the decoration image, okay? So whenever we have a variable like this, we can just load in the decoration we want, save the path, and then reuse that path whenever we load in our level again, right? Does that make sense? Instead of hard coding all the image paths, we'll store it in a variable whenever we initially load it from our editor later on, and that will save us a lot of work. Let's load the image like normal. So we'll say image equals texture loader dot load. We'll pass in the asset for the file path and then the content manager for the content manager. Let's set the name of the image to be the asset string. That way we are storing where this image is located in the name of the texture 2D. That'll be handy. Next, we can set the bounding box width to be the image width, and the bounding box height to be the image's height. It's good to do this immediately, so all this bounding box stuff is up to date. And then finally, if our source rectangle is equal to rectangle.empty, that means nothing will be drawing. If the rectangle is <laughs> 0 pixels tall, 0 pixels wide, and it's at 0, 0, x and y location, nothing's going to show up. So we want to define the rectangle that we want to draw to be new rectangle. We'll start it drawing at the top left of the image, at 0, 0, and we want the rectangle to be the entire width of the image. So this is basically saying, hey, the portion that we want to draw of this image is the entire image, right? Because we're saying we want it to be as wide as the entire image and as tall as the entire image. If you set the image.width to be image.width divided by 2, then it would only draw the first half of the image, right? Next, let's make a helper function called public void set image. It will take in a texture 2D called input, and also a string called new path. This will be a function that's exclusively called from the editor. Sometimes we will load in a texture 2D uh, from stream in our editor. Don't worry about that too much, but basically instead of using our texture loader like we always do, we'll have a different way for loading an image. And if we do that method in our editor, We'll just pass in the final texture 2D here and the new path and then set all of our variables appropriately. So if this is called, we'll just say image equals input, image path equals new path, bounding box width equals source rectangle dot width equals image dot width. 
And if you've never seen a variable be set like this, basically it's saying bounding box width equals the source rec dot width, and the source rec dot width equals the image dot width. So basically both of these variables are being set to image dot width, but we're doing it in one line. So I'm just showing you that, so if you ever see code written like this, you'll know what it's doing. We'll do the same thing for the bounding box height. All right. The final function we need is a draw function. We can override the draw function from game object. And here, instead of calling base.draw, we'll erase that because that's going to call sprite batch dot draw in game object. We want to draw things a little differently. We're going to say if the image is not equal to null and we are active, we'll call sprite batch dot draw and we will pass in our image for the texture. We'll pass in our position for the position and then here it's asking for the source rectangle so what chunk of the image do you want to draw? We will pass in our source rectangle for that. For the draw color, we'll pass in draw color. For the rotation, pass in rotation. We'll pass in vector 2.0 for the origin. We'll pass in scale for the scale. For sprite effects, we'll say sprite effects dot none. And then finally for the layer depth, we'll pass in the layer depth. So Nothing too crazy here. We're just calling sprite batch dot draw and passing in all of the variables that we've defined so our image draws like we want it to. So now this class is done. We have a decoration class that loads in an image that we can use to decorate our level. We have some helper functions here that we can use from our editor later on when we're trying to load in custom images from anywhere on our computer. And then we have this draw function that will draw the image but also use a new source rectangle to define what specific chunk of the image we want to draw. Now we need to actually put this class to use. Let's head up to the map class at the very top and underneath our list of walls or how about above it, that works too, we'll make a new public list called decor. All right. Now we need to have a function that loads all of the decorations in our list. So because this will be called every time we load a new level, I say let's create a new load function called load map and this will take care of loading the decorations. We'll pass in the content manager because that's what loads things. And then very simply, we'll just say for int i equals zero for as long as i is less than uh, how many decorations are in our list. We'll iterate through everything in this decoration list and just call load. And we'll use the second parameter list here. We'll pass in the content manager. And then for the asset, we will pass in the image path that the decoration has stored just like that and I believe this function is done so this loads in all of our decorations we do need one other function I'm going to make a function called update in the map and update in the map will just update all of the decorations in our list because there's some calculations in there we want to be sure are being called so let's say public void update and we'll pass in uh, list of game objects and we don't need to pass in a map because we are the map <laughs> okay and then here let's copy and paste the the uh, for loop we wrote there and then instead of calling decor i dot load we'll say update it's going to want the objects list and then it's also going to want a map, but since we are the map, we'll just pass in this for the second parameter. And I believe we're all done. Now we need to actually call all of these functions we've wrote inside map. So 
let's call update in game1.cs we can go up to the update function and right after the update objects call let's say map dot update passing in objects and then down here where we say load level right before we call load objects we can call map dot load map and this will load in all of the decorations that we have in our level but right now oh oops capital C on that but right now we don't have any decorations in our level so how about we fix that let's just add one background image that will draw behind all of the characters so underneath these walls I'm going to press enter I'm going to say add decor and then we'll just say map dot decor dot add new decor we'll have the decoration start at vector 2.0 in the very top left of the screen the image that we want to load is background and for the depth let's just say 1f 1f is the farthest back we can draw something at and that makes sense because this is a background cool let's press F5 and hopefully we will now see a background drawing in the back um, okay so we're not seeing a background I'm gonna ask the viewers at home here what do you think the problem is <laughs> why do you think that we are not seeing the background being drawn well, how about we do a little debug exercise here and see if we can figure it out. So I'm not going to exit out of the window. But I'm going to go back to Visual Studio and let's set a uh, breakpoint on map.update right here. And as soon as it turns yellow, I'm going to hit F11 and go inside of the function. Let's see if there's anything inside of this yep there's one thing inside of the decoration list hmm so it looks like the decorations are updating ah but they're not drawing are they because here we're calling draw walls but where do we actually call draw on the decorations yeah we don't do that right this list decor we call load we call update we never call draw so I'm going to hit the stop button at top there and this is a very easy fix we basically just need to decide where we want to call decor I dot draw and iterate through the list and all of that stuff I'd say that the best place for this is back in the game one dot CS class down here we have the draw objects function and that's where we iterate through and draw all of the objects since decorations are technically game objects they inherit from game object we just separate them into different lists I'd say it makes sense to just call that here alright so I'm going to copy and paste that for loop and instead of going through objects dot count let's say map dot decor dot count and for every decoration in the list we'll say map dot decor I dot draw alright simple enough let's press F5 yep and there we go we have a beautiful background and it's starting to look like a game we can blow up this guy <laughs> but there is one thing missing if you remember back to the beginning of our little crusade here uh, I talked about how I wanted to have a scoreboard on the window and the score will increase every time we blow up an enemy so I'd like a way to do that the a way to have a score or a heads-up display that shows our score but let's think about this for a second in the future we're going to add a camera to our game and the camera will let us move around in the level the camera can focus on different sections of the level and leave other parts of the level not seen at all right so if we draw our scoreboard inside of the game world it's possible that we can walk off the screen and never see it so to explain what I mean let's imagine that we're drawing the score on top of this black box that's floating in air later on if we move over to the right and walk off screen and that wall is off screen 
the score would also not be seen anymore, and that's not usually how heads-up displays work. Usually you want the heads-up display to be locked onto the window at all times, no matter where you're looking at with the camera. So we need to separate how we're drawing our heads-up display with the scoreboard and how we are drawing everything in our game world. So there's an easy way to do that, but let's just start simple. We'll need to create a new class called Game HUD to do all of this stuff in. So I'm going to exit out. Let's create a new class. Hopefully you know how to do that at this point. And I'm going to call the class Game HUD, H-U-D, all capital letters for HUD. I'm going to hit Add. And then let's do the normal things we do. I'm going to copy over the statements, make the class public. And Game HUD won't inherit anything because it's its own class, right? It doesn't need any extra functionality here. But here we're going to use a new variable called sprite font. And if you remember earlier, we loaded in a font called Arial into our content folder. This is where we will load in that font and use it to draw the score. So obviously fonts are used to draw text or numbers and sprites fonts work similarly to sprites. It's an image, but instead of being like a person or a building, it's letters and numbers that will make up text. All right. So underneath the sprite font, let's make a public void called load. Let's pass in the content manager content. And here we will load the sprite font using that. Let's say font equals content.load. Inside of these arrows, we will define the asset that we're loading as a sprite font. For the path, we put the font inside of the fonts folder. So we'll preface this with fonts, backslash, backslash, and then the name of the file, which is Arial with a capital A. That will load in the font, and then below, we'll make one more function called public void draw. We'll take in a sprite batch. And remember earlier I just said that we need to separate how we're drawing our game HUD and the rest of our game objects. If you can think back a few videos ago, two or three I think, we drew our game objects by calling sprite batch dot begin and then we call sprite batch dot draw on every single game object, every single decoration, every single wall we want to draw. And then we call sprite batch dot end. All right. After that, we could start another sprite batch that draws the things for our HUD. So let's do that. We'll make a new sprite batch. So we'll say sprite batch dot begin, sprite batch dot end. And then in the middle of these two calls, we'll draw everything we want to be on the game HUD. So for us, we just want to draw the score. So let's say sprite batch dot draw string. In the parameter list, it's asking for a sprite font, so let's pass in font. For the text, let's just say score 0, like that for now. For the position, let's pass in vector 2.0, so it should draw in the top left corner of the screen. And then for the color, the background color is dark, kind of black, so I feel like we need a lighter color text for that to stand out. So I'm going to say color.white. All right. And that's it for this class. Now we need to go back to game1.cs and at the very top we'll create a new instance of this class. So we'll say game HUD, game HUD equals new game HUD. Down here in the load content function, right after map.load, let's load the game HUD by saying game HUD.load, passing in the content manager. Finally, we need to call that draw function we wrote. So obviously that should go in the draw function here. After we finish this sprite batch right here, we can call game HUD dot draw to start our game HUD sprite batch.
All right. And that should be it. Let's press F5 and see what happens. Cool. So at the very top left corner, we see score zero, which is what we wanted. But it's not quite working. If we blow up the guy, the score stays at zero. And if you were playing this game as a gamer, you'd be very frustrated. <laughs> you'd probably rage quit right now. Well, I'm killing the guys, but I don't get any score. So let's fix that. Let's exit out of the window. And we need to define a variable to store our score. And since the score belongs to the player, I'm going to say that it should go inside of player.cs. And additionally, since the score will be accessed in the game HUD, and I imagine this is a global type of variable we would want to use all throughout the code, I'd say this is a good time to make the variable static. And if you don't remember, static means you can access this variable from any class, anywhere in the code, and it always stays in memory. So this seems like an appropriate time to use it. So I'm going to say public static int score. Whenever we initialize a player or we restart the level, initialize will be called, and I imagine we want to set the score to zero. You always start playing a game with the score at zero, usually, <laughs> unless you're making some type of new game that doesn't do that. Um, and now we need to increase the score, right? When do you think we should do that? Well, we should increase the score whenever an enemy is destroyed. And there's a special function we wrote that's perfect for this moment. So down here in the bullet response function, right before we call explosion.play, we can say player with a capital P, player.score plus plus, and that will add one to the player score. Now that we're calculating the score correctly, we can plug that into our game HUD. So here in gamehud.cs, instead of hard coding zero, let's backspace. Outside of the quotation marks, let's say plus, and then player.score.toString. And that's going to take this int and convert it to a string that can be added to the string we defined here. All right? So let's press F5 and see what happens. All right, score is still drawing. And the score is now one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> okay, I'll stop. But yeah, it's, it's working. It's working appropriately. So good job, everybody. Um, I feel like this is a pretty cool moment because we kind of have the core structure of a working game. I can easily see the viewers at home. You guys could easily extend this into a full-on game. I imagine we could have some more walls that you could jump up on. Maybe we have more enemies, and inside of the enemy.cs class, you can call move left, move right, making the enemies move around in the level. There's all types of possibilities here, and I think it's a pretty good starting point, a pretty good chunk of work we've completed. So good job. I know this video was... Um, <laughs> a pretty epic quest, I guess you could say, but I think it's it's paid off, right? We, we got a lot of stuff done, and we're starting to see a game form here. So I hope you enjoyed it, and in the next video, we're going to add a few things, such as a camera that lets us move around in the game world and focus on different parts of our level. So I hope that's caught your interest, and you'll tune in for the next video. I'll see you all there.